this is actually the third Kubernetes distro that I'm working with. In those kind of environments, the operating system, yeah, they are running Linux, but they are very, very custom based on different vendors and different environments. And, you know, there's a lot of custom stuff in that. So how do we create something that we actually built once and it runs anywhere? Well, by statically compiling things. You are listening to the Kubelist Podcast, a show interviewing project maintainers for open source projects with a focus on CNCF sandbox, incubating, and graduated projects. Hi, I'm Mark Campbell. Together with Benji DeGroote, we publish the Kubelist newsletter dedicated to Kubernetes and the CNCF ecosystem. I'm the founder and CTO at Replicated, where we enable software vendors such as HashiCorp, Puppet, Harness, and many others to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem software. Check us out at replicated.com. Benji is the co-founder and CEO at Shipyard, where they enable teams of all sizes to build, test, and deploy faster and more reliably via their ephemeral environment management platform. Get started with ephemeral environments at shipyard.build. The Kubeless podcast is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show or you would like to suggest a project, find us on Twitter at Read Kubelist. Finally, sign up for the Kubelist newsletter and read previous issues at kubelist.com. On this episode of the Kubelist podcast, Benji and I were joined by Yassi Nomalin of Morantis to discuss Morantis's new Kubernetes distribution, k Zeros. This was a really fun conversation where Yassi explained why a statically compiled version of Kubernetes was needed to remove the friction of operating a cluster. k Zeros is a pretty unique distribution and Yassi does a great job explaining it. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Kubeless Podcast. Today, we're here with UC Numelin from Morantis. UC is a senior principal engineer at Morantis and the tech and team lead for the k Zeros project, and we're excited to talk about that project and dig in. UC, welcome. Thanks for having me. Let's get started. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, what you did before Morantis, and kind of like what led you up to your current role working in the Kubernetes ecosystem? Well, that's actually a, a bit longer story, so I, I hope I won't hook too much of the time, but uh, I actually started working with the kind of like quote-unquote cloud-native world even well before it was actually even called cloud-native. So I've been working in IT for 20 plus years already, and and uh, I started with, with containers very, very early on. So we, we actually started to build stuff on top of Docker on 20, 2013, I think. And Docker was like like 0.4 version, actually, back then, I think. And and actually, we, we went to production with 0.4 version. And oh, God, that brings bad, so bad memories that I don't, I don't want to go there anymore. So basically, what we, what we did back then, I was working at a, at a kind of like a Finnish, kind of like a consulting shop, in a way. And, and what we built with a, with a very small team was, was kind of like an in-house Heroku clone. And that was fun. And, and that got me into, into the world of containers and what is the whole cloud-native ecosystem nowadays. That's cool. Those early days of Docker were the, were, I mean, it's fun now, but they were also a lot of fun. I actually remember we started our company, I think it was Docker. It wasn't that early. You said 04. I think I remember putting 06 into production and thinking like, this is cool. Like this makes a big difference in how we're actually deploying code. And now, now look where we are, but you could definitely see the the promise and like kind of like the, the platform shift that was coming back in you know, those early days. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think and and what you probably witnessed too is is Docker could break down it in so many ways back then. And at some point we were we were kind of joking that uh, there's there's there must be some Finnish guy working at Docker because it it broke down basically on all the public holidays in Finland. Like, <laughs> oh God, how is this even possible? <laughs> I think it broke down on all the public holidays in the United States as well at that time. So don't feel too special. Uh, I think it just broke down a lot. Yeah. So you started off super early with Docker. You were building this internal Heroku. What was the experience like trying to build a pass back then with it? And how did that kind of start to to shape your thoughts on the container ecosystem? Well, at least for me, of, of course, I mean, the whole container stuff and basically the cloud was still quite young and, and, and everything. So at least for me personally, that was a, there was a learning curve, of course. But getting into that, you started to see, like, like Mark said, you started to already that early see the, the benefits of the, the whole like cloud native way of, of doing things and thinking things. 
for us, what, what actually happened is that a uh, couple of the guys in the team that I worked with on the, on the Heroku clone thingy, they actually back then had a kind of a, like a side hustle going on around containers. And that got actually, actually then later on spinned up as a, like a real startup. That was called the container. So what we then created at, at container was, was basically like a container orchestration, kind of like Swarm thing, because Swarm didn't actually exist back then yet. So we ended up building that at a startup with the same team. Yeah, that was, that was like the early missing pieces, right? Like Docker showed application portability, you know, containerization, like the file system being like incorporated in and really building that good developer experience. But like in those 0.4, 0.6 days, it was service discovery. It was like, how do you make an application that consists of more than one container like functioning? Because like, that was pre-Kubernetes, pre-Swarm. So that actually takes us to, to now. You're you're at Mirantis and you're building a Kubernetes distribution, K0S. Can you tell us a little bit about that distribution? Like, what is it? Like, why did you feel like another Kubernetes distribution was what, what the world needed right now? Yeah. Like many great projects are born, K0 is born out of a, like, a, like a spike test that, that, okay, could we actually build something that's, that's a bit different than any other Kubernetes distro out there? And what kind of led us for that thinking is, well, at Mirantis, we, we have other Kubernetes products too. So we have this uh, MKE product, which is more like a, how to say, it, enterprise Kubernetes version. And what we heard from the people at the field working with different customers, we started to hear like like things popping up here and there about kind of like edge type use cases where people actually want to run Kubernetes in, in very, very resource constrained environments. And I, to be honest, I, I really hate the word edge. I mean, that has so many different meanings for different people, but, but like, I guess you get the point what I'm in. Yeah. And we kind of started to think about those different use cases. And th- there was like a couple of things that became quite clear for us that, that a Kubernetes in those kind of environments would need. One of them is, is the capability to actually fully separate the control plane for the worker plane. Because you, you just cannot run like, control plane on a on an RMV7 that has 500 megs of RAM. That's just not possible, unfortunately. So it was about running Kubernetes in resource-constrained environments, but so we actually use a little bit of K0S also, and like disclaimer here, like I actually really do love the project. It's really cool. I think another compelling thing that, that y'all built was you made it statically compiled. Yes. So there's no external dependencies. I'd love to hear more about why you thought that that was like valuable enough to put a bunch of engineering effort into taking plain vanilla upstream Kubernetes and making it statically compiled. Yeah. Well, so, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, I'm going to pile onto that one. Explain to me, I mean, I think I know, but explain to me anyways what statically compiled means in a Kubernetes landscape. Like, like talk us through that decision, but also like what you get out of that. Because that is like, I know some people are like, wait, what are you talking about? It does what now? So explain to us what that gets us and then why you did it, please. All right. So let me start with the why part first. In, in many of those resource constraint environments, what we're actually talking about is, is maybe like a factory floor where you have industrial automation controllers and, and many of those controllers are actually running kind of like a PCs on board. And in those kind of environments, the operating system, yeah, they are running Linux, but they are very, very custom based on different vendors and different environments and you know there's a lot of lot of custom stuff in that so how do we create something that we actually build once and it runs anywhere well by statically compiling things and what it really means for us and and how we do it is is we build everything on alpine so let's take uh, kubernetes api server for example we build it it's golang stuff so it's it's easy to statically compile we compile it against the muscle libc implementation and voila, we have a binary that works on any Linux distro. So you've got this binary that is Kubernetes and I can just install it anywhere. And like you said, it's compiled so I can target ARM, I can target x86, I can target whatever I want, or maybe not. We don't cross compile it. So, so we have different binaries for ARM64, AMD64 and RV7. 
Okay, but the tool chain can handle all of these things. Yeah, which is crazy. So, I as a uh, as a person running a, a factory line that has some weird PC from 1997, but it actually does run Linux. I can install this binary, and basically the only requirements are that I have some flavor of Linux. Is is basically it? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, of course, we working with Kubernetes, we know that things are not exactly that simple always. So of course we we have kind of indirect dependencies of kernel features and whatnot so that we can even run containers and have the proper kernel networking modules and, and whatnot. So statically compiled, meaning I don't need to bring apt or yum dependencies in, or if I'm running on a like a fork of CentOS or some weird thing like this, it's gonna likely work. But you still need a you still need C groups and modern kernels and things yeah. like this in order to run like the idea of containerization. You're not, you don't, yeah, like you still need that. Yeah, yeah. You still need the, the basic containerization and networking feature from the kernel, yes. But that's basically the only dependency that we have. For people that are like drooling over this, do you just off the top of your head, do you know like what version of the kernel is kind of when you like super saw like it, it, will, it would work? 3 point something. 3 point three point one, three point two. But um, of course, that always... I, I know, there's a lot. Well, we'll put a disclaimer at the beginning <laughs> of this. Everything we've said, there's always an edge case. Don't don't find UC's email and get mad that it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and just as a, as a, as like a practical example, some enterprise C Linux vendors, they, they have very different versioning scheme for the, the kernel. And, and it's like impossible to say what's in the kernel just looking at the version number, so... No, absolutely. And, you know, Mark was talking about the old days and I was with Mark in the super old days. And I remember being on support and having to figure out how to get rel five to, to like, we had to like recompile. I don't remember what we had to do, but we had to do something crazy to get containers to work on rel five. I mean, the interesting part for me is like one of the, the draws for me with K zeros is honestly less about those really old versions of operating systems and more I don't have to think about the, the newer releases of RHEL that come out. Like k zeros, like the statically compiled binary is going to work. I don't need to make a package. I don't need to like think about what dependencies I need to bring in and like where they're going to be located or what what moves RHEL might do in the in their packaging so that I can't just like, you know, yum install different things anymore. Yeah, that's a great point. So I, I had a quick question. We've had some pretty cool folks on on Cubelist in the past, and they've told us about really, really weird environments that they've run Kubernetes in. I feel like you might have, you don't have to be specific um, if it's like confidentiality, but can you tell us like your top two most ridiculous places that you've ever heard of or seen Kubernetes running, especially thanks to K0S? Or? Uh, industrial factory. I mean, in the actual factory. On the floor, like running the factory. Yeah, on the on the floor, like in some Siemens controller. Somehow, it's like yeah, running. Wow. Well, not not exactly Siemens, but yeah, Siemens like things. Yeah, and and that that's an actual use case where why I mentioned RV seven. So on those devices, there's one RV seven CPU, one core CPU, and there's five hundred megs of RAM, and that's it. That's the resources you have to work with. And that and that and that work. Yes. So you're saying you don't want to use all of that just to run the Kubernetes control plane and leave nothing for the actual workload that they're that they're actually trying to run. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd like to see a control plane actually running on that box because it's probably not going to run. So on, on that case, because with the K0's kind of feature, the control plane separation, control plane isolation, we in, the, in that exact case, the, the control plane is actually running kind of like on-premise cloud thingy. And then it, it's a pure worker node running on that device. Okay, so a big benefit is you can get these really thin, you know, node layer, basically. Yep. You can move things even further out onto the edge than you ever dreamed of. Yep. I mean, our, when you start talking about ARP7, I was like, okay, sure. But I, I, I believe you. Um, that's insane that you guys are supporting that. That's super cool. Another quick question, you see, because this to me is the important. I'm a hard-hitting journalist here. How do you say, how do you prefer to say K0S or K0s or what do you think is the right way to say that? This is this is the big question that everyone wants to know the answer to, I think. It's K0s. It's K0s. Just K0 plural, K0s. 
K zero. Yep. Okay. And the zero obviously is because of how lightweight it is, or what's the origin story there? It's actually actually our kind of model of of having zero friction, which means like for example, like we talk about zero dependencies and whatnot. Disclaimer: slight dependencies on C groups and some networking stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then some and and a couple of others that that we might get rid of someday. But but uh, there's actually a good example of 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 that zero friction, zero dependencies, and and how how serious we actually take it. So back a few versions in Kubernetes, like one twenty, one twenty one or one twenty two, Kubelet actually had an external dependency to find and du utilities. So Kubelet was actually just executing to du and find. And we actually found underneath, I mean, for any Linux admin, those are the basic tools that you pretty much always expect to have on installed on your system, right? But we've actually stumbled a couple of cases where those were not pre-installed by default and in an error gap environment where there's, well, you know, installing stuff is not that easy. So what did we do? We actually created the upstream PRs in Kubernetes to get rid of find and du in Kubelet code. And, and you got it merged and you got it in there. Yes. So it wasn't just k zeros doesn't have that dependency. You actually contributed back into upstream Kubernetes to, to simplify. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I can't believe there's a distro that doesn't have du. That's crazy. Uh, but that's the type of environments that we're talking about. Yeah. I guess when you're on an industrial control of running ARM7, that makes that makes sense. Yeah, for all of us that think Raspberry Pi Kubernetes clusters are really crazy, look up ARM7. That's insane. Yeah. We are actually investigating currently because uh, there's one annoying dependency in Kubelet still for its executing, executing to mount, for obvious reasons, to mount secrets and volumes and whatnot. We're actually actually currently investigating whether we can get rid of that also in upstream. That feels tricky to get rid of that yes. dependency. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be digging into some C implementation to understand how that that that, that mount command works and like is that the, is that how you do it? You might be doing some like assembly to yeah. figure out how to get around that one. Yeah, like, like I said, we're investigating. So <laughs> might no, be possible. No, no commitments. No commitments <laughs> here. Andy. So you you take all this insane friction, so we don't have to is basically what you're saying. So you yes. you figure out how to get around du, which I honestly that's the most ridiculous example. I've ever heard of a dependent. Like I didn't even think of that as a, a as a dependency until you just said that. But of course it is. I am now going to check every distro I ever go on. I'm <laughs> always going to see if it has du this this point forward in my life. Does K zeros maintain patches on top of upstream Kubernetes? No. Or talk more about that. Like how do you? It is just vanilla Kubernetes. No, you don't maintain any long lived patches on it. We don't maintain any patches on it, so we don't have any patches currently. At some point in time, we had two custom patches to, to fix some ridiculous RV7 compilation issue or something. But that's, that's about it. And, and those were fixed upstream quickly, so, so we could ditch the, the patches and whatnot. So we don't really maintain any, any, any forks or patches or anything. So no forks, no patches. And then the, like, it's the way you're installing it, like out of the box, vanilla, I start K0s. It'll pass Sonobuoy conformance tests and things like this. It's yes. like a totally valid Kubernetes cluster, not anything special. Yes, yes. And we run extensive conformance testing on, on every single release, and we have nightly runs for conformance and everything. So That's cool. So 100% coverage of the Kubernetes API. Yes, from the conformance testing point of view. I mean, if you if you look at the, the Kubernetes end-to-end -end test suite, I think that's currently like three and a half thousand test cases and the conformance is currently like 300 something test cases the conformance part yeah of course but i mean still that that's super impressive so i mean i have to ask a question i am an avid k3s fan will you talk me through the full kubernetes distro k3s and then k3 zero and where the what where where you see the different use cases lying to those different things or maybe they're all the same i just love to hear your take on that Right. I mean, of course, and, and, and that's, a, that's a question where we kind of painted ourselves in the corner with the, with the naming of the product or project. I see that now afterwards. One of the differentiating features is the full control plane isolation. I mean, as, as I, I haven't been playing with K3S in a, in a good while, but I believe 
still today you cannot do like a pure controller node without running kubelets and container Ds and whatnot on, on, on there. I think that's right. I'm not I'm not hundred percent on that one, but that sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. So so the control plane isolation without dependencies, that's a big one. Yeah. But like it sounds to me like the use case here is like super duper, and you don't like the term, but edge for K0S. K3S is maybe a little bit underpowered, less complication, less moving parts. And then Kubernetes at the the, the regular distro Kubernetes is, I don't know, hey, Google, Azure, and everyone else take care of that for me. Is that kind of the way to look at that as a developer? Or what do you think? I, I, I think that's a quite fair assessment of it. I mean, yeah, we don't want to basically compete with, uh, with say, EKS or AKS or whatever, because, you know, those work well in that cloud environment and they are built for that environment. So, so why should we compete there? Unless you have very specific use cases where you actually need to be in control of everything. One, one of the problems with EKS and AKS and, 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 and friends is that uh, the control plane is, is like a black box for you. There's very little configuration that you actually can do on the control planes on, say, EKS or AKS. Yeah. And, and there's all kinds of weird magic that, well, sometimes broken magic. I don't want to be mean, but I swear to God, the control planes on Azure go down every Friday. I, I don't know why. They, there's like some weird network stuff that happens on Fridays to Azure's. And then I see different things with EKS. I see different things with GKE. So having that granular control is, is a big, big plus. But it seems to me like, I mean... I'm thinking now, the more you're telling me this, like maybe I should be running K0S locally on my laptop. And that's like a really good a local development experience. Is that, is that, would you say that that's something that is a good use case? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that, that's a, that's a very common use case where we see people using K0S and, and, uh, the organization where, where my team sits at, at Mirandis, we have basically neighboring team that works on Lens. Mm -hmm. Have you guys used Lens at all? tried it out. Yeah, like that's the, the, the UI for managing a Kubernetes cluster, right? Yeah. The newer versions of Lens actually comes with the embedded Kubernetes environment. So for obvious local development testing purposes. And surprise, surprise, it's running K0s. <laughs> that's a pretty big one. That's cool. I didn't know that. I have some, some folks over at Shipyard, we, they really like K9S. Just a quick PSA. The reason it's called K8S is because there's eight characters in between the K and the S. And that's not the same thing for K0S, which is fine. Or actually it is. It's zero friction. So it's K0S. Yeah. I have no idea the etymology of K9S or K3S. But uh, but I, 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 I like the name. Now that I understand the origin story, I really like the name K0S more and more. I think that's really interesting. So the guarantee that I have is I can use K0S on the lightest weight machine possible and i know it's going to work when i put that load all the way up to gke or some managed uh, kubernetes distro yeah so let's talk about that a little bit more like first control plane isolation like that's a great feature but it's not a requirement of k0s right like i can still run the control plane and the workload on one just i can have a single node and do everything there if i choose to for like maybe a dev a test like a you know some other purposes yeah, absolutely. And, and and you can run even bigger clusters, say 10 machines where you run three, you're kind of like a quote unquote normal Kubernetes setup where you actually run workloads also on the on the controller nodes. Okay. So everything is everything is possible. It's just that it, in in the in the default way the control plane is isolated or got it. For the record, that's generally a good practice because you don't like you don't want workloads to be able to interfere with the control plane and then bring down the control plane and then the entire cluster fails. And you like, it's just a bad practice, like a good, reliable and scalable and like highly available way to run Kubernetes is to separate the control plane. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if, you, if you look at EKS or AKS, that's how they do it. You cannot run anything on the, on the controller nodes. Yeah, you don't even have access to them. Well, we don't know, to be fair. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> well, at, at least you cannot run your workload on there. 
On the other end, though, are there are there limitations on like the maximum size of a cluster that you would recommend before just saying no, like go to a managed Kubernetes cluster? Like, could I run a 1,000, a 10,000 node cluster on k zeros? Well, probably yes. We've tested up till 1,000 nodes ourselves. And, and that worked pretty okay. I mean, of course, we were running some simulated workloads and like your typical dummy engine exports and whatnot. So, uh, but from the control plane point of view, I think what the isolation also kind of enables you is to have more predictable scaling for the control plane. I mean, because you're not running any random workloads on there. So it's more predictable how it scales and, and how far it scales than your kind of normal case where you actually run mixed number of workloads also on the same nodes. Got it. Yeah. So what about like etcd? How does that work? Can you shim that in? Or how does the control plane handle the key value store? Or is it is it etcd? Is it something else? Uh, by default, it's etcd. And, and K0s manages etcd fully. So, so and, and it's kind of uh, as elastic as, as etcd can be. So... Say you have one controller node now and you want to scale out. What you can do is you create a controller join token on the on the first controller. Then you can join X number of new controllers and it K0 scales up etcd, reconfigures all the memberships and whatnot automatically. Yeah, I I've, I've seen that recently. So like there's a lot of stuff that K0 does in that case, right? Like you have etcd running. And then when you add the second node in, it reconfigures that CD to be distributed and like kind of, like there's a lot of things that I don't have to think about when I add that second node in. Yeah, yeah. And we wanted to implement it that way based on history. This is actually the, already my, my third Kubernetes distro that I'm working with. What I've seen in, in the past years is that etcd is, is, you know, it's tricky to maintain and manage. So we, we wanted to build all that into k zeros as, as, I mean, everything as, as that makes sense. So, okay, wait. So you're saying that I install a binary that has etcd compiled into it. So it literally just turns on, gives me, and, and high availability if I, if I give it two control plane nodes, just literally by installing k zeros. Yes. That's pretty, that, I like your, your yes was very low friction. Um, that's <laughs> crazy. Um, that, that's really cool. I did not understand that. Wait, quick question here, and this is a little off off the topic, but can I mix and match? Can I have a K3S node working with a K0S control plane, for example? Uh, hypothetically, yes, but with a very, very strong, strong maybe. Like, what, what problem are you trying to solve here? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe I'm a listener and I'm like, holy crap, this is really cool. I want to get K0S I want to use that for some nodes and I already have my K3S or even my GKE and I want to try and attach some remote compute stuff or edge compute stuff to an existing cluster, start experimenting with it. Have you seen anyone do that yet or, or if someone does that, they're going to reach out to you? And I guess we would see that in the, in the GitHub issues. Someone asking questions that, okay, is this possible and how do I do it? All right, well, you might see someone from Shipyard trying to do that. Sorry, ahead of time. Maybe that's a, I just don't want to make the whole transition. I want to practice. Start with the node. So I want to go back and talk about like the the zero friction. Like, there's more than just it's really easy to install and it's statically compiled in a single binary. There's functionality you've added in around remote node management as an example that normally, you know, in the example you gave earlier, is I can go grab a join token and run it on a second node, and then now I've added another control plane or another worker node or whatever node I want. But I think K0s has other ways, right? Like centralized ways to manage remote nodes via SSH? Oh, yeah, yeah. So one of the kind of, uh, I call it helper tool that might be actually undermining it a bit, but uh, we have a helper tool called K0 CTL. That's basically a command line tool to manage a cluster and, and a single cluster. So basically what you what you can do is, is uh, say that you have like a couple of Raspberry Pis, you have the IP addresses for those, you have the SSH key for those. You punch those out in a, in a YAML document saying that, okay, this IP is a, is a controller, these two IPs are, are workers, these are the SSH keys and, and K0 CTL. SSH in and installs everything and configures everything for you out of the box. So I can have 
my servers, Raspberry Pis or real servers or whatever set up. And then I have SSH keys, public keys on them. I have the, the private key on my machine. I can write a YAML from my machine. I can say, go make these servers a K0's cluster. This one should be the control plane. These two should be worker nodes. These are the labels. And then I run one command and it's done. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not only the, the installation part, because that's the, that's the easy part always, right? What about upgrades? And, and, and then during the upgrades, you have to do the cordon, drain, uncordon, dance, what I call it nowadays. And k CTL does all that for you. And handles the scenario where one node is unreachable or the, like, there's a failure, one didn't upgrade properly. Like that's just, like I want to go from 127 to 128 or whatever version. I run this one command and it's either going to, my cluster is 128 now or nope, the upgrade failed and here's the results and here's like, you know, I have to then obviously figure out like whether it was a connectivity problem or what it was. Yeah. And that's all through SSH keys. Yes. So you wrote a really, really, really like a one command Ansible, basically? Yes. Yes. Wow. It, it, essentially, that's what it is. And to be honest, why we did it that way and not with Ansible and whatnot, doing anything like a rollout type of a thing where you do something on one node, train it, uncordon it, and then move to the next node. Doing stuff like that with Ansible is super, super difficult. Right. And there's adding an obvious dependency of Ansible, whereas this is you know, zero friction. Yeah. Well, Ansible is good at deploying things, but like what you're describing is really a, an orchestration task. And so you needed to write like an orchestration, like runtime for it. Yes. That's cool. Wow. Mark, you knew about this. I didn't know about this. So I, you got to give me a second here to process what you're saying. So these SSH keys. Okay. So one of the things that drives me insane about G Cloud and all these other tools is it takes forever to get into these nodes because you know, download your cube config and all this stuff. So is it also just SSH? So it's like a lot faster and there's this tool. And it, you said it was K0S Cuddle, by the way, I believe. You, Cuddle? Yep. Uh, I have a thing. You see, is it Cuddle or Control? You already said Control, but obviously I've corrected you now so you know it's Cuddle. So K0 Cuddle. Okay. So that thing will literally just SSH into whatever. And that's going to be a lot faster than these other, like using these tools to just upgrade and stuff like that, or even get into the cluster itself, right? Yes. Or the node, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Wow. If I have a 10 node K0S cluster and I want to use K0S Cuddle and I just do upgrade, is it going to do that in parallel? Is it a one by one or how's that work? Uh, you can actually configure how much it does it parallel and whether it does all the all the draining and quartering dances or not. But in in the default settings, I might remember wrong here, but I think we have a default default policy of ten percent of the nodes are are done parallel in parallel. Right, but the, you, there is the capability to have multiple SSH sessions connecting to different nodes at the same time, and yeah. then you can tweak it the way that you want to do it. Yes, so it's like an even better Ansible. It's not, it's not Ansible. <laughs> it's not Ansible. I love Ansible. I'm sorry. I don't need to think on Ansible. <laughs> so I guess the point is, um, if I have a, a a properly provisioned and high available K0's cluster, I can use K0's control to upgrade it with zero downtime. But control plane and the nodes and everything. Like there, I can, there is a possibility to be able to orchestrate a zero downtime deployment to go from a minor version of Kubernetes to the next minor version of Kubernetes. Yes, absolutely. Of course, Assuming that your workload is implemented in a correct way to do zero downtime, but yeah, from the Kubernetes point of view, yes, it, it does it zero downtime. Yeah, but that's the same on EKS or GKE or anything, right? Like if I'm going to roll no a node group to a new version, like my workload better be able to handle it, or that pod might not be available for a period of time while the new node is spinning up. Yeah, exactly. So it's also a chaos tool in that sense as well. Yeah, built into K0s, you can you can you can do upgrades and see how your uh, your, your stuff handled it. Yeah. Actually, back in the day, before all this Kubernetes stuff, when we were building the container platform on top, on top of Docker, what we suggested to many many of the, the customers and, and people using it, but back then, CoreOS was was a cool thing, and, and we were heavily using CoreOS internally in, in all our, our stuff. And what we did and what, what we suggested to all the, all the people using it, have one or two nodes in the cluster running some alpha channel of CoreOS as a tool for chaos and as a tool for 
picking up when things will break in the next release and, and whatnot. Okay, so you see, uh, is there any other spectacular feature that solves a massive problem for me that you forgot about that you want to tell me about? Or Mark, is there, I'll let you see, you go first, but you seem to not know how amazing your own product is. Mark, is there, or is there anything you see you want to bring up or should I ask Mark? I want to highlight one thing about the, the zero dependencies. So Gezero doesn't only kind of package up and, and build the Kubernetes things as, as an obvious thing. We actually build up into Gezeros a lot of other things, like, for example, IP tables. So Gezeros comes with its own version of IP tables. Not its own rules, its own version of IP tables? Own version of IP tables. Let's talk more about that. There's a, there's a simple reason for that. Well, simple-ish. About a year ago, we found a, a bug in IP tables. So it's, it's basically a version of compatibility in IP tables itself. So Kubelet has a dependence I might remember wrong, but they actually maybe got it out in 128 now, finally. But back in a couple of versions ago, there was a, a dependency on IP tables. So Kubelet was basically setting up a couple of those marker rules on IP tables. And if you had certain combination of things, like IP tables in the host working in the NF tables mode, a uh, specific version of IP tables on the host, which Kubelet was by default using, and then your CNI provider, Calico, Kubrout, or whatever, was using a different version of IP tables. Voila. The first rule in the IP tables got transformed to drop all. Oh, wow. That's like the worst kind of failure mode. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And... You can imagine how fun it was to debug that. So when you hit that problem, your SSH connection dropped and everything was like dropped and like, okay, this is this is interesting. You're like, why is this not working? Like you're like debugging this thing and like it's, it's probably a black box at that yeah. point. Yeah, exactly. So what we what we ended up doing is actually actually because we from that point of one, we knew that okay, we, we can't only keep in sync the Kubernetes versions and different component versions but also the underlying tools they use, those versions have to be also in sync. So what we nowadays do with, with k 0 is we, we bundle in certain version of IP tables. We ensure that all the components that work with IP tables, they pick up the same mode, whether it's the legacy mode for IP tables or NF tables mode. And we make sure that every single component has the exact same version of IP tables bundled in. That includes QProxy, the IP tables embedded in, in K0s itself, all the CNI providers that we support and, and, and so on. And that just guarantees, like, I mean, that does a lot, but like the, the primary benefit is that guarantees the IP tables chains and the rules are going to be, like, they're going to guarantee to work because it's not the legacy or NF tables implementation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's cool. Do you deploy the standard Kube proxy with K0s? Yes. Okay. Yep. And does that use like what you were just describing there with your, your custom version of IP tables, or does that just use standard IP tables? It uses standard IP tables, but it's, it, it uses a certain version of it. Okay. The statically compiled or pinned version. The standardized version, if you will. Yeah, pin, pinned version. I think that's the, that's the most correct word here. Cool. Okay, so that's cool. I didn't think we'd ever find, interview someone who found a bug in IP tables. That, that's, I'm putting that one on my wall. That's pretty cool. Okay, so... That sounds cool. Uh, Mark, when I asked you if there's another cool feature, I saw your eyes open big. Is there another cool feature of, of uh, AZRS that you're interested by? Well, another feature that we use that I'd love to hear how it got into the product is it's more than just a Kubernetes distribution. Like You have a Helm deployer built into it. Um, you can deploy applications along with it. And I know other distros do that. Like K3S has a directory, and if you leave Helm charts in there, they'll, it'll automatically bootstrap them. Like, what is the motivation for having that type of a, a functionality in bundled directly into the distribution? Right. The main motivation was the fact that looking at at uh, the different use cases where people use K zeros and 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 given how easy it is to spin up new clusters, for example, for development purposes, and in development environment, for example, there's certain kind of uh, standard stuff that you always want to have in, right? And we wanted to have a way where the cluster, the, the ops people or, or whoever is being up the clusters 
have a simple way to get those like standard building blocks into your cluster, like, like things like Prometheus, uh, cert managers, and, and those kind of things. But it's like not just for those. If, is it stable and like a reliable feature that's documented and exposed? And if I want to use it to deploy, you know, whatever application I want to, like not just a building block, but, but you know, maybe I want to put WordPress like as a Helm chart into there or something like this, I can do that? Yeah, of course, of course. And you can just specify whatever value CML or whatever that is, and it'll just configure yep. it the way that... Uh, that's cool. Yep. And that's like a way to avoid running Helm install, kubectl deploy, or having Argo Flux or something like this in order to like kind of bootstrap a cluster. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's kind of actually statically compiling like the chart itself into the distro in a way because you don't have that external dependency of how am I going to get this thing installed. Yeah, yeah. In a way, yeah. So my bootstrap ability with K0S is pretty... Pretty crazy. Um, you're making me into a fanboy here a little bit, you see. And I don't. I, I normally don't get fanboy always. Um, so this is really cool stuff that I'm learning. He does. I do get fanboy sometimes, but not every time. But like you know, actually, do you have a way to also bootstrap like the images, the container images to the, that might be distributed as either as part of like the Helm chart that I'm deploying or the Kubernetes control plane actually, you know, sometimes needs images. Do you, do you run etcd in the cluster? No, etcd is running as a, as a plain Linux process. But like there are like, you know, core DNS, something like this that's running in the cluster. And how do you actually handle distributing all those images or do you require that all the nodes have internet access so they can pull those images when they, when they boot up? What we do is so in the in the K0s worker node, there's there's functionality. When K0s boots up, it looks at a certain directory and looks for tarball files containing images. And and if it sees those files, it'll automatically import them. And for every single release that we do, we actually build a, a air gap tarball containing all the all the needed system images. But you you can of course use that same functionality for your own applications. Say you're running in in AeroCap environment in some some bunker somewhere. So you just have your USB stick and punch in new new images, image tarball for your your own workloads, and and then restart the K zeros. And is that as simple as basically just you know, hey, I have this image. I'm just going to export it to a file system, create a tarball of all my images, and then it'll like load those into the container runtime on all the on all the nodes. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So there's also kind of like a, a registry proxy built into this thing also? No, it's it I I, I wouldn't No no I'm 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 just I know it's not actually, but I'm saying it it's it functionally I can do some crazy stuff with it. Yeah. Yeah. In a in a, in a way, yeah. You don't take me seriously about that. I know it's not a full registry. I'm just saying it's pretty cool what I can get away with with it. And in what my brain goes to, which I feel like some of our listeners' brain goes to is okay, I'm giving you my on-prem version of something or, or whatnot, and I could bake in my operator or my CRD or whatever into the actual binary and have it all there, let alone the images that I need to run my application and all kinds of stuff. And so you can just do that so it really, really simplifies. I mean, one of the things that's very frustrating for us uh, at Shipyard, or not frustrating, but time-consuming, is bootstrapping these clusters and then getting everything installed in them and getting configured correctly. But then if you just had something that you could literally just, yeah, if you could just have something that's just like, hey, here you go, single binary with a folder attached to it in a tarball and you get everything. Yeah, yeah. that's that, that's pretty much it. And and we actually have one one customer that, that's using k zeros in that way. So what they do basically is, is uh, they create one huge tarball out of everything. Including K zeros, including K zero system images, including their own application YAMLs, including their own application images in a tarball, and they bundle that as a huge tarball and ship that to their customers. Yeah, at Replicated, we've been building and helping folks ship on-prem versions of their software for a long time on Kubernetes, and like I hundred percent, I see the value in that. Like we we are looking at adopting K zeros. We have you know early versions of it. It's it's definitely solving some. It's a really good and creative solution to some of the hardest problems about application distribution and to some of these you know, kind of difficult to reach enterprise environments. Yeah, yeah. What I really like about this, just to be a little computer science-y for a second, is, you know, using Go 
as the basis of the CNC, uh, not the CNCF, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of the ecosystems based on Go and this compiled static stuff. And obviously, you're not going to write, you know, Kubernetes and Python, but just taking these core computer science principles and then now finding these really cool ways to use them. I just it still blows my mind that I can just give me a binary and it's Kubernetes. And obviously, this is not the a completely brand new concept, but I think it's really cool to kind of be using, just building on the backs of, of all this computer science work that's been going on for the last 60 years. And, and ultimately, we get so complicated to then get actually really simple. Yeah. And so that's really, really cool when that actually seems to work, which it seems like it, it really does. Um, I think that I want to know what's on the roadmap. Right. There's a few things that uh, we're we're already at least partially working on, and 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 couple of things that we have our our kind of eyes on. One of the things that we started to work on already, and and that got actually partially already shipped with uh, one our one twenty eight release a couple of weeks ago. We've started to to create full software bill of materials for K zeros, and because K zeros embeds Kubernetes, so that's containing now basically everything. And and we're we're now looking to actually provide like fully signed artifacts like binaries and everything also as as part of the release. So basically, just making sure that that uh, when people are actually downloading K zero binary, they can actually be safe and 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 sound that it is actually what it what it says it is. You said that was in the one twenty eight release or coming in the next release. Uh, this bomb part is is part of one twenty eight. The designing part will be part of the next minor release. Are you going to extend that so that I can do that to those images that I might be adding in the tarball? That's a good question. We haven't thought about it from the workload point of view, at least not yet. Well, I know Replicated would want that functionality. So you should you should put that in there for Mark and, and his team. So I like to like to kind of dive into the details a little bit. I know, you know, a couple of versions of Kubernetes ago, they started doing some of that also yep. in upstream Kubernetes. Is this a different implementation that you had to use for K-Zeros that you had to build yourself? If so, like what tools are you using to generate the SBOM or sign and you know, verify the signature of images? Yeah. Uh, for SBOM, we, we use uh, Swift to, to gather basically all that, all that information. And then... Ink or Swift, you said? Yeah. Okay. S-Y-F-T. Yep. Uh, and then for, for signing, we're probably going to use Cosign. Okay. And then... Verifying the signatures, like kind of you'll publish the public key and then somebody like it's kind of like, here's a way you could verify it, but you kind of have to verify it at install time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cool. How long does it take to get the new version of k zeros out? Like when Kubernetes 129 ships, which I think is like mm, December, early December. Yeah. What's the delay in the latency to get the next k zeros to support 129? Usually it's like two weeks to a month after the first minor release. After the first minor release. Yeah, yeah. So when that, say, 129.0 ships out, then it's usually like two to four weeks after that when we have our first release. Yeah, there's probably, it probably changes depending on what, what that minor release changed in Kubernetes. Like the effort is probably just variable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And of course, depending on, on like a number of factors, like the amount of sunspots and, you know. <laughs> yeah. For example, our 128 release got actually delayed quite a few weeks because we hit a, a, another super low-level incompatibility issue, this time not with IP tables, but with a tool called IP set. So we actually found out during the final steps of 128 release, we actually found out a, a kind of like a Linux kernel IP set version incompatibility issue, very, very similar to the, to the IP tables thing which we had to work around. But like, that's the value, like zero friction. So like, you know, I'm sure the extra couple of weeks of delay, like, A, it's super understandable. And also like, that's needed. Like that's the value that you're adding on top of upstream Kubernetes. So like, you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> no one actually, I mean, I hope no one's actually trying to, to install a brand new release in a production environment. Maybe the CNCF is going to get mad at me for saying that, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, you should be very careful if you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. The way that we actually started talking, you know, before we actually set up a time to record this podcast, is there's an issue in the K0's repo 
where you're discussing, should we contribute this project as a CNCF project versus keeping it as Marantis project with an open source license? I'd love to hear like the latest on that. Like, what are y'all thinking? Like, what are the challenges? How can people help? If it's like, you know, I really love K-Zeros, but oh man, like if it was a CNCF project, it'd be easier for me to make that like commitment, long-term commitment into the project. Like, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, and I guess you actually covered kind of the, the main motivation why we were even, even thinking about that. So having a, a kind of like a CNCF stamp on it kind of proves that we're, we're here actually for the, for the long haul and, and not just like a, staying as a, as a somewhat proprietary Although, of course, open source around this project. And also what, what having K-Zeros as a CNCF project would get is, is more kind of open and, and more collaboration throughout the, and, and in between the different CNCF projects. So, so that's what we are we're looking out of it. Of course, like in any decision, there's also downsides. So it'll, it'll require quite a bit more like governance and, and, and whatnot. And, and to set up all that functionality. So I think that's the main main thing that we're we're currently worried on that does it create like too much for the lack of better word, I'd call it bureaucracy in a, in a way. Sure. So Marantis supports making the project a CNCF project. You're just weighing like the cost of doing that, you know, making sure that it's it's justified at the end. Like the benefits outweigh the cost. Yeah, exactly. So we haven't still made the, the final go, no go decision, but I think seeing all the feedback and, and hearing from different folks on, on that topic, I think people would be fairly happy to see k as a CNCF project. But that of course means that we have to apply. So there's no guarantees whether, whether it would be approved or not. There would be some more friction. I hate to say it, sorry to be that guy, but there would definitely be some more friction if you were a CNCF project, but there's also a great deal of, of benefit. And so that makes a lot of sense. Um, if we wanted to contribute right now or be a part of that discussion, where do we go? If you want to be part of the, the CNCF discussion, then there's a pinned issue in the, in the K0s repo in GitHub. So add your, add your thoughts there and whatever you want to, whatever you have on your mind on, the, on that topic. And then of course, in, in, in general, it's an open source GitHub project, so that the, the typical when you see problems, issues, challenges, what open open an issue, and we and the community will try to figure out what's what's going sideways, and and then even better if you can figure out why things go sideways, then open PRs. Do you have community calls right now? Even though it's not a CNCF project, is Marantz still hosting a regular community call? We actually don't currently do that. We we started to do it very very early on. But there was like only a few people always, and the same people always on the call. So we didn't we didn't see the the value back then, at least. But now that there's there's a lot more people using K zeros, now it probably makes makes more sense. And that that's something that that has been on the on the thoughts for a couple of months already. That that whether we should do it or not. I will say that you know even without a community call, like you know you and the team have, have they're you know pretty responsive in the in GitHub issues, and you know like I think it's you're definitely paying attention to the community out there. Yeah, we try our best at least. And of, of course, like in any open source project, every now and then we miss some issues and comments and whatnot. So there's actually quite a few different repos that we maintain. And uh, we launched a couple of months ago, we launched a, a new project called Cosmotron and, and trying to keep up with that and, and everything. So, But like any open source project, I think I think we'd like to see more people contributing and throwing out PRs and, and whatnot, so. Of course, all open source projects. Are, I think, you, <laughs> yeah. you know, no, 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 don't contribute to this open source project. No, you definitely want that. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I really like the name Cosmotron, but I'm going to save that for the next time we have you on. You see, everyone else can go, uh, can do their own research on that one. I'm going to do it after this podcast. Just as a teaser, it's throwing cluster API on top of all of this that we've already talked about. You're killing me. All right, now I gotta go look at this too. It's too much. We're gonna put links in the show notes here for some of these. Yeah, for for me, you're gonna put links in the show notes so I can go learn some more of this stuff. <laughs> well, look, we really appreciate you coming on. Really had a, a great time. I learned a whole lot, and I am gonna be checking out uh, KCRS very soon. Really appreciate it, and uh, keep doing what you're doing, and uh, we'll be following the project closely. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Thank you. 
That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you would like to suggest a topic, head over to kubelist.com. I'm Mark Campbell, CTO at Replicated, where we enable cloud-native software vendors to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem applications to their largest enterprise customers. Check us out at replicated.com. My co-host is Benji DeGroot, CEO at Shipyard, where they enable isolated ephemeral environments on every code change for companies of all sizes. Check them out at shipyard.build. This show is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor in developer-first startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. And finally, don't forget to sign up for the Kublist weekly newsletter and read previous issues at kublist.com. <laughs>